Hi, my name is Katie Wiskar from UBC IM POCUS. I am a general internist and ultrasound nerd from Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about long ultrasounds specifically for interstitial syndromes. Uh, and a big thank you to my colleague, Dr. Shane Orishenkoff, who's our resident long ultrasound aficionado at UBC IM POCUS uh, for some of the content in these slides. So our goal for this screencast really is to delve into those vertical artifacts or B lines. We're going to talk about interstitial syndromes and how some of the nuances of lung ultrasound can help us tease out that differential. What we are not going to talk about is a lot of stuff about lung ultrasound image acquisition technique. Uh, so if you want more information about that, I highly suggest you check out the lung ultrasound image acquisition screencast on the UBCIM POCUS site. And again, as a reminder before we start, some of the beauty of lung ultrasound is its simplicity. So if you're doing it right, you should always be seeing one of four patterns. A lines, B lines, consolidations or hepatizations, and pleural effusions. And of course the pleura, and we will talk a bit about the pleura today in our screencast. Uh, but other than that, we're really going to zoom in on those vertical artifacts or B lines. So we're going to quickly start with a bit of an anatomy reminder. So this is the functional unit of the lung. This is the secondary lobule. And the secondary lobule is bordered by the interlobular septa. And if it's at the periphery of the lung, it also will abut the pleura. Now the interlobular septa itself contains blood vessels as well as lymphatic vessels. Within the secondary lobule, we have terminal airways, alveoli, vessels, as well as interstitial tissue. Now in a normal lung, the interlobular septa and the other interstitial tissues are too small and thin to resolve. So the airspace there dominates and just creates this hyperreflective surface that is revealed as a bright hyperechoic white line on ultrasound, the pleural line. In a normal aerated lung, the ultrasound beam doesn't penetrate beyond the pleura. And note that while we refer to the bright white line we see as the pleura line, it's really only the soft tissue air interface that creates that hyperechoic bright white line. The normal pleural tissue is actually too thin to resolve. Now, when the pleura is pathologically thickened and ultrasound is able to resolve the pleura itself, the pleura actually appears darker and relatively hypoechoic. Okay, our next bit of background is we're going to go back into a tiny bit of physics and just talk about how B-lines are actually generated. Bear with me, this will become relevant as we talk about different types of pathology later on. Now, B-lines are generated due to the presence of acoustic traps and channels. And these are formed when lung pathology disrupts the normal architecture of the lung and changes the ratio of aerated to non-aerated spaces. These changes allow ultrasound beams to partially penetrate that normally highly reflective pleural barrier. Now, there are a lot of things that can form acoustic traps and channels. For example, infiltration of the interlobular septa, filling of the interstitial space with water, for example, or inflammatory exudate, partial loss of the air spaces due to alveolar damage, things like that. Now, as the ultrasound beam is allowed to partially penetrate the pleura, they create small reflections within these traps and channels, which then generate vertical artifacts or beelines. And it's the characteristics of the acoustic traps and channels themselves that influence the appearance of the vertical artifacts. Again, we'll come back to this. Finally, our last bit of background is a reminder about lung ultrasound scanning technique. And again, for more on this, please see the Lung Ultrasound Image Acquisition screencast on the UBCIM POCUS site. So if we're talking about probes, you can technically image the lung with any probe, although the linear will not provide enough depth to comprehensively image the lung in adults. In comparing the curvilinear versus the phased array probe, really you can use either. We prefer the curvilinear due to improved pleural visualization and clearer delineation of the rib spaces. And there actually is some evidence that novices find lung ultrasound images obtained with a curvilinear probe easier to interpret. Technique wise, remember that the most important move in lung ultrasound is fanning, because in order to generate artifacts, we need our ultrasound beam to be perpendicular to the pleura. And note that the pleura does not always have the same contour as the chest wall. Fanning until the pleural line is as bright and crisp as possible and you've maximally visualized your artifacts will let you optimize this. In terms of scanning protocol and which points to scan, there are a lot of different protocols out there. Whatever you do, make sure you're scanning representative areas of both lungs because the distribution of pathology matters, as we'll talk about later. Finally, a few subtleties in terms of presets. So some machines nowadays do have a lung preset, although this may or may not be a good choice for comprehensively scanning of the lung, depending on your machine. These presets are often designed to focus exclusively on the pleura for pneumothorax, 
So in the absence of a well-designed lung preset, the abdominal preset can typically be used to scan the lung. And a trick to level up your scanning for interstitial syndrome specifically is to turn off the THI, tissue harmonics imaging, and MB, multi-beam settings. So these are two machine settings that are designed to minimize artifacts. However, when we're scanning the lung parenchyma for vertical or horizontal artifacts, we want to maximize artifacts. We want to see the artifacts themselves. So turning off these settings allows you clear visualization of your A and B lines. As an example, here's a comparison of the same image with the left-hand side being taken with a traditional abdominal preset, which has THI and MB turned on. And the right-hand side is on the same preset, but with these two settings turned off. And you can see the B lines are much crisper and better defined. So you've managed to generate some B lines with your ultrasound image. Now B lines are pulmonary edema, right? Hopefully by the fact that you're watching this screencast, you realize there's more to it than that. And if you take nothing else away from this screencast, please remember that B lines can be more than just pulmonary edema. Uh, and there's actually been some push in the ultrasound community to move away from the term B line and use vertical artifacts instead, because in some people's mind, B lines are so synonymous with pulmonary edema. Uh, personally, I still use the term B line, but you really need to recognize that B lines have a wide differential diagnosis beyond just cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So the differential for B lines is exactly the same as that classic differential diagnosis you learn for anything that can give you an interstitial pattern on the chest x-ray. So anything that can fill the interstitium, water, blood, pus, fibrin, cells, etc., can give you B lines. So cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but also atypical pneumonias, uh, ILD or IPF, uh, lymphagetic carcinomatosis, all of those kinds of things can also give you vertical artifacts. Now, broadly speaking, we can divide our interstitial syndromes into two buckets, cardiogenic pulmonary edema versus infectious or inflammatory etiologies. And within this infectious inflammatory bucket, clinical history and other parameters will be most helpful in teasing out exactly what's going on. So how do we distinguish between these two groups? There are four main things that we can look at, and we're gonna go through them in turn to fill out our table here to help us tease this out. So the first thing we can talk about is pleural morphology. So under normal conditions, the pleural line should appear as crisp, bright, and smooth on ultrasound. In contrast, here we have B lines which originate from a pleura that is ragged or irregular. And changes or disruptions to the pleural line contour indicate changes in the structure of the periphery of the lung. For example, things like ARDS or interstitial lung disease that result in structural changes due to inflammation and fibrosis. An abnormal pleural line is often described as cobbled, ragged, or fragmented. It can be associated with what are called subpleural consolidation, so these small circular or triangular spots of consolidation immediately deep to the pleural line. And it can also be associated with decreased or absent pleural sliding. In contrast, cardiogenic pulmonary edema does not actually result in significant structural change to the subpleural architecture. So the pleural line still appears bright and crisp, despite the B lines that are arising due to filling of the interlobular septae with fluid. And here again, we can compare those two clips. So note that while both contain B lines, we can see that the pleural line from which the B lines arise is quite different, smooth and crisp on the right versus ragged and irregular on the left. The second piece of useful information is the characteristics of the B lines themselves. So here we go back a bit to ultrasound physics and the acoustic traps and channels that generate the B lines. So when the acoustic traps and channels are regular and uniform as seen here on screen left, such as in the case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where we have fluid filling the interlobular septae and interstitium, but no actual distortion of the underlying lung architecture, then the B lines themselves are uniform and appear at regular intervals throughout the rib space. In contrast, when there's been distortion of the underlying lung architecture, such as in pneumonia or ARDS, the acoustic traps and channels are irregular and disparate. They therefore generate B lines which are non-uniform, so they may seem to arise from only part of the interspace or even from a single point, for example. So this is what this looks like. So in this clip, we can see B lines are present throughout the interspace at fairly regular intervals, and they all appear to be a fairly uniform size and brightness. 
In contrast, here we see bright beelines which seem to arise from a single irregular point on the pleural line, a tiny little subpleural consolidation, and we actually see A lines across the rest of the interspace. The next thing we can look at is the distribution of beelines across the thorax. So with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, beelines should be bilateral, symmetrical, and in gravity-dependent gradient that is most prevalent at the lung basis. In comparison, with infectious or inflammatory pathologies, beeline distribution is usually asymmetrical. So there may be skipped or spared areas of A-lines, and it may be non-gravitational, so most prevalent, for example, at the apices with relatively spared dependent zones. So lastly, we want to look at other associated ultrasound features. So with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, this can include things like bilateral simple pleural effusions, markers of elevated CVP, elevated left atrial pressure, or cardiac scans that support a CHF picture. With infectious or inflammatory pathologies, these might include signs of pneumonia, like a shred sign seen here, dynamic air bronchograms, complex pleural effusions, or other findings. And this is obvious, but it's always worth stating, never forget the importance of integrating the rest of the clinical picture with your ultrasound findings. So POCUS is never meant to be a standalone test, so things like clinical history, vital signs, physical exam, lab findings, other imaging parameters, all of those things are essential in helping you put the pieces together. So here's our completed table to help us differentiate B lines from cardiogenic pulmonary edema versus infectious inflammatory B lines. So we can look at the pleural morphology, B line characteristics, the distribution of B lines across the thorax, and associated ultrasound findings. And now that you've recognized all of the information that beelines can give you, it's important to document your findings properly. So just writing beelines present is not nearly as useful as documenting the information we've talked about. So be specific about beeline morphology, the distribution, the pleural line, all of those things. And it's also important to note that these two types of beelines can coexist, and you may have a mixed pattern which has some characteristics of both types of beelines. So especially in these cases, describing what you're seeing in detail really gives you the most information and is the most useful. Finally, here we have a quick case to illustrate some of the principles we've been talking about. So I've purposely omitted the clinical information from this case just to focus on the lung ultrasound findings. Uh, but obviously in real life, you would integrate all of the rest of your data with this. So here we can see lung ultrasound clips from the right anterior chest. For, this, for us, this is R1 and R2. And we see diffuse beelines across several rib spaces with a fairly smooth, uniform appearing pleura. And the beelines themselves also appear to be quite uniform. Moving to the right lateral chest, R3, and right base, R4. So in R3, we still see beelines, although they're starting to look a bit less uniform across the rib space, and there is some pleural irregularity. In R4 at the right base, we see a shred sign and a small pleural effusion. Moving over to the left side, so at the left apex, we see these really dense beelines arising from what seems to be a quite irregular indented pleura. There also appear to be A-lines just next door to that interspace. Coming down the chest a bit in L2 with a hardened view there, we actually do see A-lines. This is called a skip area. In the left lateral chest, this is L3, we see a couple of B-lines, but in much lower density compared to the right side. And at the left base, again, we have a bit of a shred sign and consolidation and a small accompanying effusion. So if we go through our table and put our case together, the pleural morphology was somewhat mixed. There were some areas that seemed quite smooth on the right, although some definite areas of irregularity, especially on the left. Likewise, in terms of beeline characteristics, the beelines in the right upper chest seemed quite uniform, but elsewhere they were much more disparate and not equally spread throughout the interspace. In looking at the distribution of beelines across the chest, this was certainly asymmetrical. The burden of beelines was much greater on the right side. There were also skipped areas with A-lines on the left side of the chest. And finally, in thinking about associated features, so there were a couple of small shred signs bilaterally along with effusions. And while these can be seen with atelectasis, they could also be indicative of an infectious process. So putting this all together, there's certainly enough here to say that this is not pure cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There certainly seems to be an infectious or inflammatory etiology at play, with the irregular pleura, the non-uniform B lines, the asymmetrical distribution in those skipped areas. 
Now, it's impossible to exclude a degree of concomitant cardiogenic pulmonary edema, uh, but certainly that's not the major driver going on. And clinical history and other POCUS findings would help put the rest of this picture together. All right, that's it. Uh, hopefully this was useful uh, and will help you get a little bit more out of your lung ultrasound in those difficult to diagnose cases with some of these nuances. Uh, so we really encourage you to visit us at GBCIM POCUS to see more screencasts uh, and happy scanning.